call the court to order at this time. Um, my name is Matt Rothy. I'm the Stoughton Municipal Judge. That covers the jurisdictions of City of Stoughton, Towns of Dunkirk, Pleasant Springs, and Rutland. I'd like to go through some of the procedures we follow in our courtroom. The procedures should have been available to you in the pamphlet as you enter the courtroom. Um, we take people on a first come, first serve basis. This is plea night. Um, when your case is called, please come forward. You'll be asked to enter a plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. Um, if you enter no contest or guilty plea, I'll review the, uh, your police report and citation, and if there's sufficient evidence, find you guilty and impose an appropriate forfeiture. A plea of no contest is similar to a guilty plea, but a conviction arising from a no contest plea um, or it cannot be used against you later civil action. Uh, for example, if you uh, enter a no contest plea, say you're involved in a traffic accident, and in the traffic accident you receive a citation. If you enter a no contest plea, the person cannot use that no contest plea against you if they sue you for damages r resulting from that car accident. Essentially, no contest plea is basically you're not admitting guilt, but you want it to res be resolved tonight. Um, forfeiture range from $20 to $1,000. However, almost are within the $50 to $200 range. The state mandates we add cost to your forfeiture. For example, a $50 forfeiture will result in a total fine to you of $124. Now, I'll grant you 30 days to pay the fine. If you need additional time, please let me know and we'll arrange a payment plan. Um, if you do not pay, I have limited options to collect. I can suspend your driver's license for a year. I can intercept your tax refund or send your amount, your uh, fine amount to state collections. I'd rather not do that. If you need additional time, just let me know and we can work out a payment arrangement. If you enter a, a not guilty plea, we'll schedule your, I will order that you appear at the next pretrial conference where you'll meet with the city attorney to see if you can resolve your case short of a trial. The pretrial conference date will be November 6, 2019. Uh, it's held in this, is that upstairs or downstairs? That will be downstairs. Um, there's a conference room on the first floor of this building where we conduct the pretrial conferences. Um, any order of your Okay. Those of you here facing traffic offenses sh should understand that you lose demerit points upon conviction of most such offenses. If you lose 12 or more points within a one-year period, you lose your dry license to drive for a period of time. You will also be fined. Um, I'd like you to be aware of some of your rights before you enter a plea. Um, you have the right to ask for a continuance. That means that you can ask for your case to be set over for another time, either to consult with a lawyer or for some other reason. This is a civil court. You're not entitled to a public defender, but you may hire an attorney at your own cost. You also have a right to a trial. Please remember your rights when considering your plea. That con concludes my opening remarks. Uh, the first case we have tonight is Maggie Schomburg. Good evening, Ms. Schomburg. Good evening. Do I have your correct address on Skyview and Janesville? Yes. All right. You were cited for speeding on a city highway 11 to 15 miles an hour over the limit. Do you understand what, what speeding on a city highway is? Well, I didn't realize it was a highway, but yeah. Okay. Highway is basically any, any road on the state that's, uh, that's considered basically a street that's not a private street, essentially. Okay. Now, speeding, it's 11 to 15 over, and that results in four demerit points issued your license and a total forfeiture of $90.80. Now, the forfeiture range on this is $30 to $300. However, you are at $30 plus cost. You're at the minimum forfeiture for that level. In other words, I can up the fine if I want to. I can lower the fine. I can't lower it any more than the $30 where, where it's at. Um, in addition, I, tend, I give people 10 mile an hour leeway. So instead of 11 to 15 over, what I would do is I would reduce this today to 1 to 9 over. Um, if you are in a no contest plea, the, the city prosecutor and I made an agreement that they would make it the same offer, so they've authorized me to make that uh, one and nine over, which would be three points instead of four. That so would, same yeah. forfeiture of, of yeah. 90, 80, 80. And then um, normally I would grant 30 days to pay on that as well. So, Thanks. okay. Any questions regarding the speeding citation? No, but. Okay. What I'll do is, what, so what is your, I'll, now I'll, I'll take your plea. What is your plea to the amended citation of one and nine over? No contest. No contest? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you understand no contest plea, I'll likely find you guilty? All right, let me read the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your okay. plea. In other words, I want to make sure that there's sufficient evidence for the citation. Okay, and there is. I have reviewed the, the police report. I do find a factual basis for your plea, except your no contest plea, and find you guilty. I will impose a penalty of $98.80 and, and uh, find you guilty of one to nine miles an hour limit for three points instead of four. How much time do you need to pay? Um, I could pay it next week. Okay, I'll give you 30 days. Okay. I'll give you a disposition form um, in just a minute. 
take that that form indicates where you can send the 9880 into just make sure that you pay within 30 days because if you don't my options are either to suspend your license for a year or to send you to collections and i'd rather not do that so yeah okay that works any questions for me no that's wonderful thank All you right. your honor. if you want to step forward i can hand you the site the disposition and order and that will take care of it this evening then all right thank you michael william dean Uh, do I have your correct address on Apollo Circle in Stoughton? Yes, 727. Yeah, I just so I, I want to make sure that if we have to send anybody notice that I have the correct address. Yeah. Uh, you've been cited for failure to yield the right of way to a pedestrian, bicyclist, or EPAMD. Yeah. Do you understand the nature of the citation? Yes. All right. Uh, the penalties are um, forfeiture of $98.80 and four demerit points issued your driver's license. And I'll make a note that you've already paid the 9880. Right. Um, right. Let me give you the forfeiture range on this. Okay, it is 23A. It's actually, uh, this says, 34623 subsection 1. Uh, oh, a pedestrian involved with it. Oh, okay. As a pedestrian, it has a different forfeiture. 20 to $40. So you're at $30 plus cost. You're in the middle of a, of a tight range. So you understand the nature of the citation. Do you have any questions for me regarding the citation? The reason why I make this a mandatory appearance is that if you're found guilty of any type of failure to yield the right of way, the Department of Transportation mandates that we uh, mandates that you take a class in order to keep your license. If you don't take that class, uh, your license will be suspended. And the reason why I make this a mandatory period is I want to make sure that people are aware of this, this class requirement and that if they, and that comes from the Department of Transportation, right, not from right. this court. So that if they get it, that's what the, the notice is for. You understand that yep. as well? Yep. Okay. So you have no questions to the court? Uh, with no further questions, now is the time I take your plea. Guilty, no contest, or not no guilty? No contest. Okay. You understand with no contest plea, uh, I'll likely find you guilty? Right. All right. Let me read the police report. I want to make sure I have a basis for your plea. Okay, I have reviewed the police report. I do find a factual basis for plea, except a no contest plea and find you guilty. I'll impose the forfeiture of 9880, which you've already paid. Right. Um, since you've already paid for that, I don't need to do anything further. Any questions for the court? No. No, so once you receive that citation, then that will take care of it this evening, and you'll be getting a notice of the class in the mail. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Totz. Mr. Todd, so I have your correct address on Page Street in Stoughton. Yes, sir. All right. You received a citation for retail theft, intentionally taking less than $500. Uh, this citation carries a penalty of $187. Do you understand what retail theft, intentionally taking less than $500 is? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the forfeiture range on this is $50 and $1,000. I'll note that you are at $100 plus cost as okay. a forfeiture, not quite at the minimum. Um, in addition, uh, there's a potential that you could... Um, for retail theft, whenever there's retail theft or shoplifting, there's a potential for um, restitution. Mm -hmm. You know what restitution is? Yep. All right. That's where you have to pay back the merchant for the value of the merchandise. Although I will note that on my sheet it does say Walmart, and I know we didn't take pay. anything. Okay. For in Walmart, it normally the Walmart's practices are that they don't bring a restitution action yep. as well. So. Okay. Any questions for me? Nope. Now's the time I take your plea guilty, no contest or not guilty. No contest. You understand? Um, with no contest, we'll likely find I'll likely found you guilty. Yep. All right, let me review the police report. I'll let me just make sure that there's a factual basis for your plea.
Okay. I have the police report. I do find a factual basis for really accepting no contest plea and find you guilty. Anything you'd like to say before I decide on a sentence? No. All right. I do find the $187 forfeiture to be appropriate. I'll note that it is uh, past practices. Walmart may or could request a restitution hearing in front of me, but it's their past practices, they typically do not. How much time do you need to pay? Um, 30 days. Okay. I'll give you 30 days to pay the forfeiture. The uh, bailiff will hand you that sheet in just a minute. If for whatever reason you need additional time to pay, there's a number on here that you can call. What will happen is, is that you can call schedule of hearing time. It's usually 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. Uh, the prosecutor is usually here, you weigh in, and usually with the first request, none of us have any objections. All right. Thank you. With that, that will take care of it this evening. Thank you. Brandon Vitense Vale. Do I have your correct address on Page Street in Stoughton as well? Yep. All right. And you are Brandon of I-10 Vale? Yep. All right. I've been also cited for retail theft, intentionally taking less than $500, also known as shoplifting. The citation carries a penalty of $187. Forfeiture range on this is $50 to $1,000. You're at $100 plus cost. Do you understand that? Yep. You understand what, re what retail theft is? Yes. All right. Um, now, in retail theft cases, there, um, and you pro I know you just heard this, but I have to say the same thing for every defendant. I know that the, um, there could be a restitution case in there where the merchant asks for a uh, hearing in order to get their merchandise, uh, the value of the merchandise back. You understand that as well? Yep. And I also note that this is also a Walmart case, so that Walmart typically does not uh, send in restitution requests or requests. Normally what happens on these is I get a amount for restitution. They typically don't do that. You understand that as well? Yep. All right. Any questions for me? No, sir. Now is the time I take your plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. No contest. You understand with no contest, I'll likely find you guilty? Yes. All right, let me read the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your plea. I have read the police report. I do find a factual basis for your plea, except for no contest plea, and find you guilty. Anything you'd like to say before I decide on a sentence? No. Nope. I also find the $187 forfeiture to be appropriate. I will not order restitution, but be aware that Walmart could request a restitution hearing from this court. All right. How much time do you need to pay? 30 days. Okay, I'll grant you 30 days as well. I'll give you the, uh, we'll print out the disposition order and have the bailiff hand that to you in just a minute. If you need, find you need additional time to pay other than the 30 days, there's a number on there you can call and schedule a hearing, in which time I would hear your request to ask for more time. All right. Any questions? No, sir. They'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you. Rosario Stephen Petrinos. Mr. Petrino, so I have your correct address on Skyline Drive in Stoughton? Yes, correct. You received a citation for automobile following too closely. This citation carries a penalty of $124 and three demerit points issued in your driver's license. Do you understand what automobile following too closely is? Yes. All right. Forfeiture range on this is as follows. 30 to $300. You're at $50 plus cost. You're not at the minimum, but you're on the low end of the range. you understand that as well? Yes. Okay. Any questions for me? No. Now is the time I take your plea. Guilty, no contest, or not guilty? No contest. You understand that with no contest plea, I must find, I will likely find you guilty? Yes. Okay. Um, it's not a mandatory appearance. This isn't a, a class issue. Okay. Um, no contest plea. How come normally people, when they come in and contest this, they want to contest this? How come you came into the... Um, I came in today because... Um, so I thought that I was doing the right thing by looking in my mirrors, but actually I... If you have any doubt about this, you should enter a not guilty plea. All not, right. Not guilty plea and then have discussed this with the prosecutor. Because on these, I can, I've reached an arrangement where I can amend speeding citations, but right. not any type of traffic ticket. So I can't give you a break on the points All right. or anything like that. If you want to discuss the prosecutor about the mirrors and other issues, that's what I would suggest then. All right. Okay. So we'll enter a not guilty plea on your behalf. So we'll give you the notice for a pretrial conference. It'll be November 9th. It will be two weeks from tonight. 
it will be a pretrial conference. I order that you appear. So meet with the prosecutor, and I always ask that people uh, familiarize you themselves with the room before you go. It will be on the first floor. You go through this double set of doors. There will be a conference room on your left. There will be a sign marked pretrial conference. All right. Make sure that you go, because if you don't go, the prosecutor tell me that you didn't appear. I'll find you defaults, and I'll find you guilty and impose those penalties. And then bring over what, whatever witnesses or evidence might help your case. All right, thank you. All right. Once you receive the, the notice of pretrial conference, that will take care of for this evening. Rodney Dorr. Mr. Dorr, I have your correct address on Nelson Street in Stoughton? Yes. All right. You received a citation for failure to yield the right of way from a stop sign. This citation carries a penalty of $98.80 and four demerit points issued your driver's license. Do you understand what failure to yield the right of way from a stop sign is? Yes. All right. You don't need me to review the statute at all? all right. I could read it to you or explain the elements? It's okay. Just want to make sure. Forfeiture range on this um, failure to yield citation. You're at thirty dollars plus costs. The forfeiture range is twenty to fifty. So you're not quite at the minimum, but you're kind of in the middle of a narrow range. You understand that as well. All right. Yeah. Um, is that a yes? I understand. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We're we're being recorded. So if I make a mistake and you want to appeal me, we have to establish a clear record on that. Yeah. Actually, there's a TV and audio right there. Um, this is a mandatory appearance. The reason why I make it mandatory is that any type of failure to yield, the Department of Transportation, uh, if you're found guilty of this, will send you a notice that indicating you have to take a class or your driver's license will be suspended. I always want to make sure that people are aware of this class, so that's why I make it a mandatory appearance, uh, so people are aware that they have to take this class. You understand that as well? All right, nodding his head yes. All right, any questions for the courts? No. Now is the time I take your plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. No contest. You understand when no contest plea, I'll likely find that you're guilty? All right. Nodding ahead, yes again. Let me review the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your plea. Okay. I have the police support. I do find a factual basis for your plea. I'll uh, accept your no contest plea and find you guilty. You like this, anything you'd like to say before I decide on the sentence? Mm, no. Okay. I want help. <laughs> I've already went around with enough people okay. on this one. I have, okay. I do find the $98.80 forfeiture to be appropriate. How much time do you need to pay, sir? I can pay it today. Okay, I'll give you six, or I'll give you thirty days, just in case. But if you want to take this down to the dispatch window, you can present it to them and then make payment as well. Okay. Dispatch window is the window downstairs. Uh, with, with, they'll they'll accept payments then. Okay. And once you receive that, they'll take care of it for this evening. Then. Thank you. Now, do I? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Do I have to go? You said I have to go to class. The DOT will send you a class. You have to indicate to take a class for any type of failure to yield. Okay. It's it's outside of this court's control. It's just it's done by the Department of Transportation. Okay. Yep. Oh, here, here. Here's a class list of classes if you want them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Kelly Lebanski. Ms. Lebanski, do I have your correct address in Skyline as well? Yes. Okay. Um, you received a citation for failure to yield the right of way from a stop sign. The citation carries a penalty of $98.80 and four demerit points issued your driver's license. Do you understand what failure to yield the right of way from a stop sign is? I do. Okay. Um, forfeiture range is 20 to 50. You're at $30 plus cost. You're, you're almost at the minimum of, the for, of an arrow forfeiture range. Do you understand that as well? Yes. Okay. It's a mandatory appearance. I do that because this, if you're found guilty of a, a failure to yield the right of way, the DOT mandates to take a class in order to keep your license. You understand that as well? Yes. Any questions for the court? No. Now is the time I take your plea. Guilty, no contest, or not guilty? No contest. You understand when no contest plea will likely find you guilty? Yes. Let me read the plea support. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your plea.
I have reviewed the police report. I do find a factual basis for plea, accept your no contest plea, and find you guilty. Um, anything you'd like to say before I sign the sentence? No. Okay. Uh, I do find the forfeiture to be appropriate of um, $90 a cents in order that you pay that. How much time do you need to pay? Just a couple days. Okay. I'll give you 30 That way, okay. if, if you, um, for whatever reason, um, 30 days should be safe then. So yeah. you can pay either mail it in or, or, uh, or take it to the dispatch window either way with that. Instructions will be on the form. Once you receive the disposition order, that will take care of it for this evening then. Thank you. Do I have a class that I need to take? Yeah. Oh, they will. Okay. Brody Daskasil. Uh, Mr. Daskasil, do I have your correct address on Lake Higanza Road? Yes. All right. You received a citation for speeding on a city highway 11 to 15 over the limit. That citation carries a penalty of $90.80 and 40 merit points issued your driver's license. Do you understand the, the elements for speeding on a city highway 11 to 15 over the limit? Yes. All right. Um, the forfeiture range on this is 30 to $300. You're actually at the minimum $30 plus cost. In addition, for these speeding citations, I give a 10 mile hour leeway. Um, so instead of 11 to 15, uh, what I would do is I would uh, amend this to 1 to 10 over with the permission and uh, blessing of the prosecutor. You understand that? So if you'd be found guilty, it'd be 1 to 10 over, which would be 3 demerit points instead of 4. You understand that? Yes. All right. Now, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Daskasil, um, are, do you have a probationary license? Yes. All right. Is this your first citation? No. Okay. For your second and subsequent citation, second, third, etc., the point totals on these citations double. So instead of even if I reduce it to three, the three would double to six, and you'd have this citation would be six demerit points. You understand that as yes. well? Yes. All right. And I don't have a copy of your driver's record in front of me, so I don't know anything. That's why I had to ask. But I want to make sure I advise you. Okay. Any questions regarding your probationary license? Um, is there anything I can do to gain points back on my license? You can take a point reduction class, any point reduction class, and you get three points back, or you can enter a not guilty plea and talk to the prosecutor to see if you can further negotiate that. Do you have information for that class? Uh, do we? I have a basic traffic safety class as well. Okay. And with that, so. And remember, if you accumulate 12 or more points within one year period, your license will be suspended. So this one, even if I amended the three, three double to six, that means you couldn't, basically, if you have a probation license, most moving violations are three points or greater, three to six. Mm -hmm. So if you get another moving violation in the next 12 months, you lose, you'll have accumulated more than 12 points, your license will be suspended. Do you understand that as yes. well? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, I don't want that. Right. Uh, any qu any further questions of the court? No. Now is the time I take your plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. No contest. You, you understand with no contest plea, I'll review the police report and likely find you guilty. Yes. Let me review the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your plea. I have reviewed the police report. I do find a factual basis. I'll find you guilty of 1 to 10 miles an hour over the limit, which would be 3 points instead of 4. Um, minimum forfeiture, you're already at the minimum forfeiture, so I'll impose a penalty of $98.80. Do, uh, do you need time to pay? 30 days, please. Yep, I will grant you 30 days to pay. You can um, instruct. You can either mail it in or drop it off to the dispatch window downstairs. Uh, any other questions for the court? No, thank you. All right. When um, we will print out a disposition order, the bailiff will hand that to you. Once you receive that, that will take care of it this evening. Then. Okay, thank you. Actually, 
Excuse me, time again, drink water. Heather Johnson. Ms. Johnson, do I have your correct uh, address on Johnson Street in Stoughton? That's correct. Um, you received a citation for failure to yield the right of way. This citation carries a penalty of four demerit points and $111.40. You understand what failure to yield the right of way is? Yes. All right. <clears throat> Forfeiture range on this citation is as follows. And remember, for the forfeiture of the citations, it's, if I say it is 20 to $40, so you're at $40 plus cost, you're at the maximum of a narrow range. The uh, $40 increase with all the fees attached to it, from, so it goes from 40 to $111.40. Do you understand that as well? Correct. I do. Uh, in addition, um, this is a mandatory appearance. Any type of failure to yield class, the, the State Department of Transportation will mandate that you take a class in order to keep your license. you understand that as well? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so you understand what fair deal right away is as well? Yes. Any questions regarding the citation? Um, actually, I, was, I didn't know if we had an opportunity to speak against the police report. Normally what would happen with that is that if you have, if you have any objections to the police report, I can't hear that until after I've convicted you. But if you want to discuss that with the prosecutor, what I would suggest is you enter a not guilty plea, um, discuss with the prosecutor, and you can discuss any type of um, anything that was mentioned in the police report. I haven't seen it, so I don't know what it says. Okay. Is that what you want to do? Yes. Okay. We'll enter a not guilty plea and, um, and set this matter for a pretrial conference. I'll order that you attend a pretrial conference with the city attorney. Bring whatever doc documents or witnesses might help your case. If there's an inconsistency with the police report or an error, uh, what have you mention that the prosecutor and that you see if you're able to resolve the case short of a trial um, make sure that you appear because if you don't appear i'll find you a default and i'll find you guilty and impose those um, penalties as i mentioned earlier and, and you'll be mandated to take the class with the dot now in addition to that and then i always advise people go take a little room before you leave it's up on this floor t t today but next time we'll be on the first floor there's two sets of uh, uh doors and then at, through the second set of doors, there'll be a conference room on your left. That's where it will be. Through the police it. department entrance. Yep. Okay. Yep. Any further questions? Um, not that I can think that of. That will take care of it for this Thank evening. You Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Anna Forrest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do I have your correct address on Walker Way in Edgerton? Correct. Okay. You received a citation for speeding in a 55 mile an hour zone, 20 to 24 over the limit. That citation carries a penalty of six demerit points and a forfeiture of $149.20. Do you understand what speeding in a city highway 55 over is? Correct. Do you understand the 20 to 24 over is as well? Yep. Okay. And that's six points and $149.20. Now, forfeiture range on these speeding citations are 30 to $300. This is the, um, your forfeiture rate, this is $70 plus cost, and you got that because of this, the speeding was increased uh, more than 20 over the limit. Now, what I do for these cases is that I uh, give a 10 mile hour leeway rate. So instead of 20 to 24 over, this would be 11 to 19 over. That would result in three, or excuse me, not three, four points instead of six. Okay. You understand that as well? Yep, correct. Normally I keep the forfeiture the same at $149.20. Understand that as well? Yep, correct. Any questions for me? No. Now is the time I take your plea. What are you, uh, guilty, no contest, or not guilty to speeding 11 to 19 over the limit? No contest. Okay. You understand with no, no contest plea, I'll likely find you guilty? Yes, correct. Let me re review the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your okay. plea.
I have reviewed the police report. I do find a factual basis for your plea, except for no contest plea, and find you guilty of 11 to 19 over, four points for forfeiture 149.60. How much time do you need to pay? I can pay today. I'll give you 30 days, but if you want to make payment, you can take this downstairs to the dispatch window, present it to make payment then. Okay. okay. Thank you. No further questions. I'll take care of it for this evening. Then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Justin Tetchy, did I say your name correctly? No, sir. What is it? Tech. Tech. Thank you. Mr. Tech, do I have your correct address on Main Street in Stoughton? Yes, sir. All right. You received the citation for hit and run unattended vehicle. Yes. The citation carries a penalty of one hundred and eighty-seven dollars and six demerit points issued your driver's license. Um, do you have a probationary license? Yes, sir. Is this your is this your second or subsequent citation? No, sir. Okay. Uh, so if it's your first citation, it stays the same at six points. If it were more than that, if you get another citation, um, any point totals uh, will double. And most traffic citations are between three and six points. So if you get another traffic citation, if you're found guilty of this and get another traffic citation the next year, your license to drive will be in jeopardy. You understand that as well? Yes, sir. All right. Now, hit and run a down to 10 of vehicles. Do you understand the elements of that a citation? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, forfeiture range on this. Is zero to two hundred dollars. You're at a hundred dollars plus cost. You're right in the middle of the range. You understand that as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, that concludes the all the, ex the explanations I um, give to you. Do you have any questions for me? No, sir. Now is the time I take your plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. Not guilty, sir. Okay. With a not guilty plea, we'll schedule your matter for a pretrial conference with the city attorney. I order that you attend that, that pretrial conference. I'll give you notice in just a minute. Make sure that you appear at the pretrial conference because if you don't appear, uh, the prosecutor tell me you didn't appear, I'll find you in default and I'll find you uh, guilty of that citation and impose those penalties. Uh, pre-trial conference is a chance to tell your side of the story, so bring whatever witnesses or documents might help your case. Um, and lastly, I always advise that people go take a look at the room before you go, so you're familiar with it. It's on the first floor of this building. Tonight it's in a different spot, but in two weeks from tonight it will be in the first floor. Go through the second set of doors, it will be a conference room marked on your left. Okay. okay. Any questions for me? No, sir. All right, that will take care of it this evening then. Thank you. Tyler Marshall. Mr. Marshall, do I have your correct address on Page Street in Stoughton? Yes. All right. You've been cited for disorderly conduct. Uh, that citation carries a penalty of $124. Forfeiture range on the disorderly conduct is $50 to $1,000. You're actually at the minimum amount of $50 plus cost. You understand that as well? Yeah. You understand uh, what the elements are uh, for disorderly conduct? Yes. All right. Um, any questions for me? No. Now is the time I take your plea. Your three plea options are guilty, no contest, or not guilty. Not guilty. Okay. The well, not guilty plea will schedule this matter for pretrial conference on, on November 9th, and we'll give you the notice of that in just a minute. Um, I'll, I'll order that you appear. So if you. Oh, I'm sorry. I said the, the, November 6th. I said November 9th the last time. So November 6th. My apologies. Um, make sure that you appear at that date, because if you don't appear, the prosecutor will tell me that you didn't appear, I'll find you in default and guilty and impose those appropriate penalties. The pretrial conference is a chance to tell your side of the story, so we'll bring whatever witnesses or documents might help your case. And lastly, I always advise that people take a look at the room before you go. It's on the first floor Go through the sec of this building, go through the second, the double, both doors, and it'll be a conference room on your left. Okay? All right. Any questions for me? Uh, no. That will take care of for this evening. Then. Thank you. Stephen Gerke. To expire registration. Yeah. 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 Did you want to just give to him that way? Here, I've got actually another one. The releases. First of all, do I have your correct address on Norman Drive in Stoughton? Yes. You've been cited for disorderly conduct, or not, <laughs> excuse me, 
operating after registration, suspension, registration, and that is a forfeiture of $90.80. Uh, you have release of liability. Did you sell this car? No. I took care of everything, um, paid what I had to pay, it went to the state. Okay. And so got you, everything released, released through the state of Wisconsin. Okay, I got it. So it's released. In other words, they released the liability, you've paid everything, and yep. that, uh, and then have you reinstated the registration? Yes, I have. All right. Goal of this court is to make sure that you update your registration. You successfully have done that, so the court will dismiss this citation. Okay. Thank we you. We can give you a copy of that dismissal notice then. Okay. Okay, thank you for coming in, Mr. Cook. You betcha. All right, thank you very much. Rebecca Bishkoff. Did I say that right? Bishkoff. Bishkoff, all right, I did not. I was watching, well, a movie about <laughs> Russians in World War II the other day, so I, I, my, my apologies. Do I have your correct address in Taylor Lane in Stoughton? Yes, sir. All right, you received the citation for speeding on a city highway 20, 20 to 24 over the limit. That citation carries a penalty of um, six demerit points and a forfeiture of $149.20. Uh, do you understand what speeding on a city, do you understand the elements of speeding on a city highway? Yes, sir. And you understand the, the for 20 to 24 over that carries the, pe the six point penalty? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, uh, you've been 45 minutes or 40 minutes in. Um, we had another one of these. I have to give the same explanation as well. I give a 10 mile, hour, 10 mile an hour leeway for these citations. So. Instead of 20 to 24 over, it would be 11 to 19 over the limit, which that would result in a four demerit points instead of six in the same forfeit. Do you understand that as well? Yes, sir. All right. All right. you have any further questions for me? Um, is, I mean, if I'm guilty, can I plead guilty? No yeah, well, tonight? certainly you can. So either no contest or guilty. There's please. no insurance. Like, it's the same either way. Well, right? if, there's, if there's a doubt, I always... If, you, if you're not sure of the doubt, no contest plea always appears better. That way you're not admitting guilt, basically. Okay. But the, the result is almost always the same. All right. Any other questions? No, sir. Okay. Now is the time I take your plea, guilty, no contest, or not guilty? Uh, no contest. Okay. Uh, you understand with no contest plea, will likely find you guilty? Yes, sir. Let me read the police report. I want to make sure I have a factual basis for your plea. And that is um, a no contest to speeding 11 to 19 over the limit. I have read the police report. I do find a factual basis for your plea, except your no contest plea and find you guilty 11 to 19 over the limit, which will result in four points instead of six, forfeiture of $149.60. Anything else you'd like to say? No, sir. All right. How much time do you need to pay? I can pay right now. Okay. I'll give you 30 days just in case uh, whatever happens. Sometimes people forget their wallets or so forth. So, uh, But you can make payments down at the dispatch window downstairs. Okay. Thank you Once so you much. receive the disposition order, that will take care of it this evening. Thank you. Parker Schmidt. It's okay if I come up with him. He's my son. Ah, sure. That's fine. Um, you you are not an attorney, correct? No. Okay. You cannot speak on behalf of him. That there's rules. So I can't way. say anything. Well, you can. You can ask questions on that, but you can't. You can't start directing me what to do. Basically. Oh, or, or, fair enough. That's, yes. That's. Just to set the ground rules. What happens is you have to be a pro, you know, have to be an attorney yeah. to represent somebody in court, um, usually. Right. Mr. Schmidt, do I have your correct address on uh, Page Street, Stoughton? Yes, sir. Okay. You received uh, two citations. Let me explain each of them in, in turn. First one is for speeding in a school zone, that um, 11 to 15 miles out of the limit. That citation carries a penalty of four demerit points and a $124 forfeiture. Uh, do you understand what speeding in a school zone is? Yes, sir. And you understand the, the 11 to 15 over the limit as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Now it's four demerit points, and the forfeiture on this is, the forfeiture range, you're at $50 plus cost, and each of these citations have a forfeiture range, and what I can raise or lower depending on um, addition, 
additional factors in the case. I always, I'm required to give you the forfeiture range on these as well. Okay, P46A. Uh, it's 40 to $300. dollars so you're not at the minimum, but you're, you're at $50 plus cost. The minimum would be $40 plus cost. You're, you're fairly close to the minimum. Um, in addition, uh, do you have a uh, probationary license? Yes, sir. Okay. For moving violations on the second citation, the point totals double. You aware okay. of that as well? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. So, and then you have a second citation. The second citation is operating motor vehicle without proof of insurance. That citation carries a penalty of ten dollars and zero points. This is not a moving violation of zero points, so the point totals would not double on that before. Have you had any prior moving violations? No, sir. Okay. So. On the speeding in a school zone, what I do for these is I give a 10 mile an hour leeway. So instead of 11 to 15 over the limit, I would give a 1 to 10 over the limit, which would result in three demerit points rather than four. Yeah, it's still three. So that will save you a point. And if you, if you get a second subsequent citation in the next year, if you get six points, you're sunk. But if you get a four points, that will double to eight. Okay. And you have pre three previous, so you would have 11 accumulating. You would have one point left on your driver's license. Okay. Not to encourage you to get any additional citations, but I want people to be aware of their, their basically their driving status as well. You understand that? Yes. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, no. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah. Like, this is my first time here, too, so it was... Uh, it was one of those situations. You can't really explain the citation okay. to me, though. The reason why is that the prosecutor's not here. Gotcha. And if what happens then is that that's called an ex parte contact. In other words, that's Latin for, basically, I don't even know what the Latin means, but it basically means that my, I would become tainted. And if one side speaks to me, I would have to recuse myself for that. So that if sense. you want to explain it to the prosecutor, look for, um, discuss it beyond the, the three-point citation then you probably should enter a uh, not guilty plea. If the, if you're, if the three point citation and the $10 fee is acceptable, then, um, and then you probably should enter an no old contest plea usually works. Now, as far as the $10 citation goes, um, has the vehicle been registered? Yes, it was at that time as well. We just purchased that vehicle. Do you have proof of insurance with you today? I do on my phone, yes. Okay. Shows all three vehicles. Okay. Normally a court will take this into into evidence, but I won't do that for the oh, court. Right. Thank you. I see. So this was effective date back in March, was it? Okay. Thank you. You provided me adequate proof that the the motor vehicle was insured at the time, so the court will dismiss the operating motor vehicle without proof of insurance citation. So as far as the speeding, any further questions on the speeding citation? No, sir. Okay. I, I would only have one, sir. Yeah, and, go ahead. Uh, Would it be something that he could get community service instead of a, a char yeah, instead of a, uh, you know, have to pay a fine and get three points deducted? He's considered an adult in these for traffic. Okay. A lot of times I get community service for juveniles. Yeah. But as far as the DOT citations, the problem with those are is that, oh, it was a while ago. It was 20 years ago, but everybody used to give to a charity yeah. and avoid the, the the troubles and then the, the State Department of Transportation kind of sent an angry memo out to all 72 prosecutors indicating that the problem that occurred is that of the if this is a $50 forfeiture I think that's what it was so the, the resulting forfeiture between 50 and 74 so the state we collect $74 that goes to the jail and crime lab that goes to a lot of different fees and those funds were I think funding mechanisms were suffering a little bit yeah. so I think that that's I don't think I'm, he would be eligible for, well, it, it could be, I suppose, in extraordinary circumstances, I, I could find that he was eligible for community service, but in this case, I, since he's an adult, I would usually treat all traffic offenders the same way. Okay. What's your thoughts, man? Uh, I'll let him. Yeah, any other questions? Oh, that's all. Again. All right. Now is the time I take your plea, guilty, no contest, or not guilty, and if you'd like, I can explain each of those to you. Uh, not guilty. Okay. Well, not guilty plea, we'll schedule this matter for a pretrial conference with the city attorney. I, with the pretrial conference with the city attorney, what will happen is that um, I'll order that you attend the pretrial conference. It'll be two weeks from tonight. It will be a conference room downstairs. Um, order that you appear. Make sure that you appear because if you don't appear, what will happen is the city prosecutor will tell me that you didn't appear. I'll find you in default and I'll find you guilty. 
um, and impose those penalties. Now, as far as these, um, make sure that uh, giving you that guilty plea, and make sure that um, chance to tell your side of the story to bring whatever witnesses or documents might help your case. And lastly, um, make sure that you're familiar with the room will be in a conference room on the first floor of this building. You walk through two sets of doors, it will be a conference room on your left. Okay, great. Thank you. And you got, yeah, once you get the notice, I'll take care of it this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And just so I'm, that uh, the insurance one has been waived, correct? It's been dismissed. dismissed. Thank you so much. Observing me. Are you Judge Hoffman? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. I am, and thank you. It just, I made it mandatory for POD to yield, and we're, it's just something I wanted to try, so we'll, we'll probably reconsider some of that then. So. Okay. Well, welcome. We're six o'clock trial. Everyone is here. Why don't we? City attorney here though in the office still. Because you get those pre-trial. Yeah. Sorry to jump in. Yeah, it's okay. He will be here. It's Kurt. Okay. Well, I guess you have to stick around in case. Yeah. Let's let's go through some of the defaults first. Walter Bancroft is a uh, bond forfeiture. Christopher uh, Barber is a default judgment on both citations. Casey Beard is a default judgment, all three citations. Michelle uh, Betcher is a bond forfeiture. Jacob Christensen is a default judgment. Frederick Dubois, Dubois is a default judgment. James Hammes is a default judgment on both citations. Daniel Hoffman is a default judgment. Heather Hamner is a default judgment. No um, restitution at this time. And here you go up there. Okay. Okay. If you want to have a seat, uh, we'll wait for the prosecutor to come in. The first page. Thank you. Oh, I have a. What do I have? I have sent him the form that we request to reopen, so okay. I don't have it. Hi, Anna. If you want to step up to the microphone. Okay, Mr. Annan, you're here for a motion to reopen? Yeah. All right. You have uh, three citations, one for criminal damage to property, another for operating while revoked, and a third for theft of movable property. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you missed a hearing date? Yeah. Why did you miss a hearing date? I was never notified of the date. Okay, you're not notified. And then you believe you have a defense of these three citations? Correct. Okay. City's position? We do not oppose, Your Honor. Okay. I'll grant your motion to reopen. I'll give you a mandatory pretrial conference on November 6th. I'll enter not guilty plea for these three citations. Time will be a mandatory pretrial conference on November 6th at 5.15 p.m. Okay. I'll give you that notice. Just make sure that you appear, because if you don't appear, it's much harder to open up, uh, op reopen these cases a second time. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, these are the pretrial conferences? Yes, Your Honor. All right. As you recall, I'm filling in for Attorney Collins tonight, so and I hope I did Mr. everything. Semantic? Semantic? Semantic, yes, sir. Right. And I hope I did everything right. Apologize in advance if it is not clear. I had a lot of defaults tonight, Your Honor, so I'm hoping oh, that oh. those weren't screwed up too badly. Did Mr. Walker not appear for the hearing to reopen? Not yet. Okay. Pre-trial conferences are approved. All right, now, is there anything else for City of Stoughton Prosecutor? Just in case that Walker shows up, but I don't think he will. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, for the parties that are here, to, uh, we'll wait a few minutes. Um, let me default some cases, and if I, if, um, Mr. Walker doesn't appear by 6.05, I'll go ahead and default him then. If he does appear, um, I'm willing to stick around, Your Honor, if that's helpful. But I know there are some other. Right. We have, a, we have an OWI trial is the thing, so I don't know. Okay. I don't want to make you stick around for, for a while. So I, I will, if he shows up after 6.05, I'll take it into consideration then. So. Understood. Okay. Default one more page. Uh, Jada Jones is a default judgment. Lila Jorgensen is a bond forfeiture. Nicholas Crone is a bond forfeiture. Ronald Lund is a um, default judgment. Sandra Markison is a bond forfeiture. Andrew Mathis is a default judgment. Nia McBride is a default judgment. Keith McIntyre is a default judgment on both citations. Shay Mitchell is a default judgment on both citations. Todd Nelson is a default judgment. Nina Nevins is a default judgment. Eric Olson is a default judgment. Uh, David Ritter is a bond forfeiture. Christina Robertson is a default judgment. Tina Schlitt is a default judgment. Elizabeth Seeger is a bond, excuse me, default judgment. Daniel Seppens is a default judgment. Juan Carlo Vela Soriano is a bond forfeiture. Dana Virgiston is a default judgment. Michael Walls is a bond forfeiture. Shanika Watson is a default judgment on both citations. The court will be um, in recess for three minutes.
I don't remember. I guess it's, it was quite a while ago. I mean, here's the problem I'm facing. This is six years old. It's beyond the time to reopen the case. Um, so if you normally what the procedures are is that if you receive a citation, we've been giving it to you at the scene. I wasn't given to me at the scene. There's, they have no proof I did anything like that. Right. I've never been able to defend myself for it. Well, I'm going to deny your motion to reopen just upon the age of this. Is it is it the real? Um, is it an issue of the uh, the forfeiture amount? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I, if there's ways that we could just find find a way to settle it, if I can community service it off, or I, I know I have a lot of cons, you know serve time from my last sentence. So, here's what I'm going to do: is that um, I'm going to deny your motion to reopen just upon the age of the case. I think we're beyond the the the, the normal time we can you know beyond the statute of limitations for opening it. Um, but, uh, Mr. Walker, what is your uh, current? Do you have your current address? Okay, what, here's what I'll do. So, um, right, I'm going to have my clerk contact you and send a letter and also to the prosecutor, and that, that way the clerk will have the prosecutor's uh, uh, address and number in there. The, 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 I'll give, that way you can re reach in contact, be in contact with the prosecutor to air your concerns. If the parties are not able to, re to um, if they're not able to resolve any type of issues that you might have, we'll schedule this for a hearing to discuss the forfeiture amount and how the forfeiture can be reduced. Okay. Taxes. Okay. So fifty-four ninety is the amount owed, and then one fourteen was the original bond amount. Then, okay. So that that'll be the order of the court. Then, as I'll have my clerk uh, send letters to both of you. That way, the prosecutor and the defendant can see if they can resolve the uh, balance of fifty-four dollars and ninety cents, and then um, see if that can be resolved. If it can't be, then the hearing will be scheduled to see if we can address those remaining concerns. Okay. Um, so, what's my next step then? Um, you'll get a note from the court, or a letter from the court, and then just for after you get the note from the court, um, call the prosecutor's office to see if you can resolve the remaining uh, forfeiture issue. Yeah. Uh, any questions? No, uh, thanks for your time. Okay. Does the city have any questions? Uh, nothing further. Right. That will we'll take care of that case. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank that, you, sir. That will conclude the city of Stoughton matters. Court will call the case of Town of Pleasant Springs versus Emma Catherine Holland. You have proved the land analyst to appear via phone, okay. so that's we get her when it get to that point. is called Town of Pleasant Springs versus Emma Holland. Uh, please state your appearances. Good evening, Your Honor. The Town of Pleasant Springs appears by Council Dan Evans. I'm sorry? Dan Evans, EVA. Thank, thank you, Mr. Evans. And Ms. Emma Holland appears in person along with Council David Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Okay, it's my understanding that uh, we're here for a trial tonight on uh, operating while under the influence, failure to keep vehicle under control, and non registration of auto. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. That is correct. Okay. And have the parties been unable to reach a resolution for this matter? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. That is correct. Uh, would the city like to make an opening statement? Uh, not really, Your Honor. I do want to say there is a pending motion as part of this matter that I received the two days ago from defense counsel. I would assume, I have appeared before this court before, but I would assume that you could just take the evidence uh, on the 
OWI matter and make a decision on the suppression motion uh, at the conclusion of the evidence or another appropriate time? I typically take, um, I usually will hear both the motion to suppress and the trial at the same time. Is that any, any additional opening statements? No, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Not at this time. Okay. As the uh, town may call its first witness. Yes, Your Honor. We'll call uh, Deputy Schaefer. Deputy Schaefer, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of we got? Please be seated and state and spell your name for the record. Oh, I don't think either parties are um, familiar with this. We're actually being auto. We're actually on TV right now, and so we're creating a not just a TV transmission, but a uh, audio recording as well. Uh, please state and spell your name. Deputy Trent Schaefer, T R E N T S C H A F E R. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, what is your occupation? I'm a deputy sheriff for the Dane County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed as a deputy with Dane County? Uh, over 15 years. And what are your what are your duties now? I currently work field services out of the Southeast Precinct. And what do f uh, field services consist of? Um, I drive around in a squad and respond to calls for uh, service. All right. And how long have you been doing field service? Uh, over 10 years. Uh, what sort of training did you go through uh, to become a law enforcement officer? Uh, well, I got a college degree and then went to the uh, full law enforcement academy. Uh, and then I've had numerous other classes, uh, seated field sobrieties. I'm an currently an instructor for standardized field sobriety. Uh, I'm currently a field training officer, uh, was a jail training officer. Uh, just and then at four times a year, we also do train uh, in the sheriff's office. Uh, with respect to OWI enforcement, what experience do you, ha do you have as a sheriff deputy and in enforcement of OWI laws? I actually have a lot of experience. Uh, I've worked uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. my whole career, so uh, I deal with uh, a lot of impaired drivers just due to the nature of the time that I work. Thank you. And does your training also include uh, training to operate an intoxicator ECIR2? It does. Okay. Back on um, January 27th, 2019, uh, were you working at that time? I was. And were you working the third shift again? I was working late. I think my, I was working for the town of Pleasant Springs from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All right, thank you. And uh, again, were you working as a patrol, well, a, a uh, I want to say patrol officer, but a, a patrol deputy at that time? I was. And around 10.16 p.m. on January 27th, were you dispatched uh, for a call? Yes, I was dispatched to a vehicle that was in the ditch. And did you get a call that a vehicle was in a ditch? You got a call that there was a vehicle in a ditch in the town of Pleasant Springs? That's correct. Okay. And where was, did, did you go to that scene then? Yes, I was actually uh, very close because it was not far from our precinct and that's where I was. Uh, it was like the 1900 of County N, which is in the Pleasant Springs County of Dane, state of Wisconsin. Uh, I observed as I pulled up, I pulled up at 10:18, two minutes after the call, and I did observe a vehicle uh, way down in the ditch. And what were the road and weather conditions like at this time? Uh, the roads were not great, and the, it was extremely cold. Uh, what were, was there snow on the ground? Yes. Was there snow or ice on the road? Yes. Uh, how deep was the snow, do you recall? I know there was some slush and snow on the road, and I know there was a lot of snow in the ditch area. What, um, how far was this vehicle off the road? Uh, it kind of went in at an, at an angle and it was on the west side of the road because uh, County N runs north and south and it was off the road, I don't know, 30 to 50 yards. Was it over on the side of the road that it would have been driving on or was it on the opposite side? Do you see what I'm, at, what I'm asking? If, because it's a north-south road, right? Yeah, so it would have been on the same side as it was driving on. Uh, what did you do then when you got to the scene? Did you get there around 10, 18, you said? Correct. And uh, what did you do then once you arrived at the scene? I made contact with the, there were two female occupants in the vehicle. Um, I made contact with uh, the driver who I identified as Emma Holland. And can you describe what did you do to get to the vehicle? It wasn't easy. There was like trees and branches and snow in the way. So 
I kind of had to maneuver to get down to the vehicle. And how far was this off the road, do you recall? You know, kind of at an angle, like 30 to 50 yards, I estimated. Okay. What, um, what did the exterior of the car look like at the time that you went up to the vehicle before you talked to the, to the driver and occupant? There were, like, branches and stuff kind of around it. All right. And what was the depth of the snow, if you recall? A foot, foot and a half. And you made contact with the driver? I did. And how did you identify her? I think maybe verbally at first. At some point, I, I think I had some kind of driver's license or identification card. And did you, you had, uh, I think you testified this, but did you identify the driver as a defendant in this case, Ms. Emma Holland? I did. And were you able to verify her age? Yeah, she was 17 years old. And what did you notice anything about uh, Ms. Holland with respect to possible use of intoxicants? I did. Her eyes were bloodshot and glossy. Uh, she was slurring her speech. Um, when I was speaking with her, I detected a noticeable odor of intoxicants coming from her person. Now, um, there was another occupant in the car? There was. And did you, who did you later identify that to be? Nadine, with the same last name. And that was the defendant's mother? Correct. Or is the defendant's mother? Yeah. Correct. Um, what did you then do after you made initial contact with Ms. Holland, the daughter? I had her walk up to my squad, uh, and on that evening I think the, it felt like negative 11 degrees, so I had her sit in my squad while we figured out what was going on. And after uh, Ms. Holland exited the vehicle and went into your squad car, uh, did you continue to notice any odor uh, of intoxicants? Yes, I continued to notice an odor of intoxicants. Did you notice uh, Ms. Holland continuing to have slurred speech? I did. Uh, did you ask Ms. Holland if she was the driver? Yes, and she stated she was numerous times. And did you ask her numerous times? Yes. And why did you do that? Just to get clarification. Um, did, and again, did, she, did the defendant say she was the driver? Yes. Um, what did you then do when you had, um, you had Ms. Holland in your squad car? Um, you notice, again, the odor of intoxicants. What, what did you do then? Uh, well, at, at some point there, we, me and a partner went down back down to the vehicle and assisted the passenger up to the road, and uh, she appeared extremely intoxicated, was struggling to even walk. Uh, I came back at some point and made contact with Emma, the defendant, uh, and asked if she'd do field sobriety tests. And what did she tell you? She, she said she didn't want to do them. She made a comment how they were scary or scared of them or something to that effect. All right. Did you ask uh, Emma where she was coming from? Yes, Utica Bar. Is, and did Emma tell you she came with the Utica Strike that. Did Emma tell you she was coming from the Utica Bar? Yeah, apparently to pick up her mom at the Utica Bar. And did you ask uh, Emma if she was drinking? Yes. And what did she tell you? Uh, she initially told me that she was not. Did you ask, um, did Emma tell you anything with respect to her sobriety? She made a comment that she was absolutely sober, something to that effect. Was her, what was her speech like when she, she's telling you this? She was still slurring her speech. Did you ask uh, Emma how fast she was going? Uh, I don't recall if I asked that specific question. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Um, did you then, um, at some point then you asked her if she would do field sobriety tests, correct? Yes. And what did she, again, what did she tell you? I stated she did not want to do them, thought they were scary. And so um, at, at some point though, um, did you continue to ask Emma if she had been drinking? Yes. And did she ever admit to drinking to you while she was with you at your squad car? Yes, she admitted to having a couple shots of Fireball. Did she tell you where she was drinking at? I don't recall exactly where she was drinking, but she said she had a couple shots of Fireball. Do you know, what is Fireball? It's a hard, it's a cinnamon tasting hard liquor shot. Um, <coughs> uh, 
at some point did you have Emma exit your squad car while you're still at the scene? Yes. And what did you do then? She was placed under arrest. Okay. And did you search her? Yes. Did you find anything of evidentiary value? Yeah, she had like three uh, little drink chips in her pocket. And what, what, can you describe what a drink chip is? They're pretty common in Wisconsin. You can, a lot of times the bartenders will give people drink chips when they're at the bar and it just says that you get a free drink, turn it in for a free drink and then they keep the chip. Um, you placed uh, Emma under arrest, then what did you do? I transported her to the Stoughton Police Department. All right. During your interaction with Emma at the time, you know, your interaction with her at your squad car, out of the squad car, back in the squad car, and then back to, well, to the Stoughton Police Department, uh, did you continue to notice odor of intoxicants or um, alcohol from Emma? I did, and she was uh, stating something about, like, she was going to hyperventilate when she was in the squad, so I was trying to calm her down while I was transporting her down to the Stoughton Police Department. As you were transporting her, what was Emma's um, demeanor like? Very emotional, uh, crying, upset, I guess you could say. And what did you do then when you, uh, at some point you arrived at the Stone Police Department, correct? Correct. Um, what did you, what did you do then when you got to the Stoughton Police Department? I started a 20 minute observation period. Did you, um, at some point, did you read uh, an informing the accused form to Emma? I did. Was that, I guess, after or during the 20 minute observation? Yes, during. Okay. And the informing the accused form, um, is that the standard form that you would use for an OWI case? It is. Deputy, could you take a look at that exhibit um, and tell us <coughs> what what's depicted in Exhibit A? It is the informing the accused form from this case. Uh, you see the case number and Emma's name, and that's definitely my signature and uh, time and date. And then I circled yes because she said yes to the breath test. Okay, so on this form, you see that the uh, there's the implied consent notice on the the bulk of this form, correct? Correct. Did you read this form verbatim to the defendant? I did. Did you then ask the defendant to do, submit to an evidentiary chemical test for breath? I did. And what, did, what was her response? She stated that she would. All right. And then so did you write the word breath in as we see on this exhibit? I did. And you circled yes, correct? I did. And then it looks like there's a, a time on this at 1.06 a.m., is that correct? That's just the time I sign it. Oh, okay. Got it. So were you... Just so I'm clear on the timeline, you went to the scene at, it's off the road, you arrived around 10.18 p.m., correct? Correct. You know what time approximately you made it back to the Stoughton Police Department and began the 20-minute observation? And It was definitely less than an hour. Um, this form was probably signed when I was actually up at the Dane County Jail, so okay. well fast-forwarded from this, where we're at right now, timeline. All right, thank you. Um, during the uh, 20 minute observation, um, basically at some point you attempted to do this test, correct? I did. Uh, the 20 minute observation you, is a standard protocol before doing the intoximator ECIR2 test, correct? Yes, you don't want them to drink, eat, smoke, vomit, regurgitate, things like that. Uh, make sure they don't have anything in their mouth, uh, observe them for 20 minutes and then start the test. All right. And what was Emma's demeanor like during this time? Uh, upset, emotional. All right. Um, now tell us, uh, at some point, did you attempt to do the intoximeter uh, test? I did. Uh, I am certified to run the intoximeter. I have been for a number of years now. Uh, I gave her numerous instructions on how to do the test. Uh, she was not uh, 
putting any type of breath through the tube. Instead, she appeared she was like sucking in. So I was unable to get any samples on both sequences. So it turned out to be an, uh, it basically turned out to not have any value on the test at all. Yes, this is the uh, intoximeter test. Okay, and again, it looks like there was, is it fair to say for that exhibit there was no test sample, correct? No, if there would be any test sequence, any sample, even if there's only one, it would show the level, even though you'd have to have two in a sequence to count for a sample, it would show one and it shows none. So none of the samples provided were adequate. So it counts it as a deficient sample. When you administered the intoximeter test to the defendant in this case, or attempted to, um, based on your training and experience, was the intoximeter machine working and operating correctly? Yes, definitely. It was, uh, it was all that she was not providing adequate samples as I demonstrated. And the time that's on, are there times listed there where you know, the test sequence begins for the samples? Yes. And you believe that those were accurate as uh, the approximate times that you were then at at the Stoughton Police Department and trying to administer this test. Correct. Uh, it looks like 11.10 p.m. is when the intoximeter started and it ended at 11.19 p.m. Did you, well, Emma was trying to give a sample. Did you instruct her on how to give the breath sample? Numerous times I even would take a clean tube and try to demonstrate how to do it and how simple it is, and she was still unable to do any of the samples. Based on what happened with you trying to administer the intoximeter test with Emma, uh, what did you do? In her, in her failure to comply, what, what did you decide to do? Uh, I asked her if she'd be willing to do a blood test. And why did you want to do a blood test then? I guess to have some sample. And how did you, where were you when you asked the defendant this? At Stoughton, at Stoughton PD. Okay, was this the proximity to the intoximeter machine as you're trying to administer it or right after? Yeah, after. And how did you ask Emma if she would submit to a, a blood test? I just asked if she'd be willing to do a blood test. And what did she tell you? She said yes. Um, so based on her telling you that, what did you do? I transported her to the Stoughton Hospital. Now, you didn't read the informing the accused the second time, correct? No, I did not. Uh, what did you do? Um, so what did you do to transport her to the Stoughton Hospital? Uh, I just put her in my squad and just drove her over there. It's obviously a close proximity to the police department, so I was, I was there pretty quick. All right. And so then what did you do once you arrived at the, at the uh, Stoughton Hospital? Well, I started filling out the necessary paperwork for the blood draw, and uh, Emma started to... Uh, physically shake her legs and arms were shaking uh, she started slapping her face her she was slapping her own face with her hands uh, she made comments how she was going to jump off a bridge kill herself uh, and the the nurse that actually did the blood draw or the phlebotomist was trying to calm her down it took quite a while to calm her down what it did Emma while she Emma's at the hospital did she ever tell you she wouldn't do the blood test no what did you do to try to help calm her down? Uh, I actually had uh, two Stoughton officers come. Uh, she made comments how she hated needles, and she was her body was physically shaking. So I had Stoughton officers come there to help me because during this type of procedure, I have to fill out all the paperwork for the blood draw and document time, so I can't be assisting with that. I have to be kind of documenting my important times and information. And what did the... From your observations, what were the Stoughton officers doing to assist? Trying to calm her down. <laughs> Fair to say, Emma was in a emotional state at that point. I would say highly emotional at that at that point. All right, and at some point, though, was a blood draw 
uh, successful? I mean, what was the phlebotomist or the the person doing the blood draw able to? I'm going to object. Calls for speculation. If you could rephrase your question, I think I, I there was a compound question there. Okay. Deputy, at some point, did uh, in your observation, was the person drawing the blood from Emma able to draw blood samples from her? Yes, it, it did take a little while just because she was physically shaken and they were trying to hold her still, but eventually, yes. I do. Okay. And what, what, what is that document? This is the form that's inside the blood kit that goes with the blood. Uh, I can tell this is definitely my handwriting. Uh, if you look at the collection time, you can even tell I kept, had to keep changing the time just because we were, again, like I said, trying to calm her down and get the sample. So the, uh, the blood that you, well, the, you said there's a blood kit. What kit did you use in the blood draw of the defendant? It's one that the hospital already has. Uh, they're already prepackaged and sealed. Uh, so it's the one like from the, that all the hospitals have that the state uses. And had you worked with blood kits before? A lot, yes. What part of that form do you fill out? I basically fill out everything uh, through E, except for the, obviously the signature and the signing of uh, who did it, but I, I put down the time, the date, everything else, and then and F down is is when they're actually sending it out and testing it. Going back to while the blood draw is being done, um, were, you, were you still noticing an odor of intoxicants from Emma? Yes. And what was her speech like during that time? Well, she was still slurring her speech, but I mean, she was also, you know, crying and emotional during that time. Did she say anything during that time if she had been drinking? She made a comment how she had not been drinking at that time. What did you do then once the blood was drawn by the, um, oh, whoever on the form is it? The form was marked at some point by the person who drew the blood? Yes. And did you see that? I do. Did you see it happen while at the while the blood drop was going on? Yes, I I watched the whole thing, and then once the blood kit was packaged, it was handed to me, and I kept it until it was packaged at the jail. All right, and the part that the I'm sorry, I don't have an extra copy that you noticed the person who drew the blood at the hospital was filled out. Would that have been the specimen section D specimen collection? It is. Okay, so once the blood is drawn, what did you do? I took the evidence, which was the blood, and I transported uh, Emma up to the Dean County Jail. Okay, and what did you do with the blood then? Uh, after Emma was booked into the jail, I walked downstairs to the basement of the public safety building where the evidence room was. I packaged it, labeled it per protocol, and filled out a uh, hygiene lab request where they test the blood and put that in there and lock the uh, refrigerator and left. And is, was there a standard protocol for when that happens? What happens to the blood uh, from the sheriff's department? We actually have people that are constantly working in the evidence room and they're responsible for object this <laughs> calls for uh, hearsay and speculation as to what happened to that blood. Well, Your Honor, if I could respond, I think it goes to standard protocol and procedure for what happens to the blood. Okay. I'm going to allow the question under the business record exception under the hearsay rule. Deputy, so I'll ask the question again. What's, to your knowledge, what's the protocol when you do take a blood kit like this into the evidence locker um, and fill out the form for the state lab of hygiene? 
a deputy who works in the evidence room will transport that blood kit to somebody at the hygiene lab and then they'll return it with the results and that all gets documented. As you were uh, transporting Emma to uh, the public safety building, what was her demeanor like? Emotional. Based on your interactions with the defendant, or the time you, you know, first approached, you know, to her vehicle. Um, to your interactions with her to the point where you took her to the public safety building. Um, were you able to form a opinion on whether the defendant was impaired? Yes, I definitely felt she was impaired. And impaired by what? Intoxicants. Alcohol? Yes. And Based on your contact with the defendant, along with your training and experience, do you have an opinion as to whether the defendant's ability to operate a motor vehicle was impaired by alcohol that she yeah, consumed? I object to calls for a conclusion of law. I think it goes to the weight and not to the credibility, so I'm going to allow the question. Then I, I can determine what, what's, what's going to be credible or not, so thank you. So, uh, Deputy, again, based on your contact with the defendant and your training and experience, do you have an opinion as to whether the defendant's ability to operate a motor vehicle was impaired by alcohol that she consumed? Yes, I do feel like uh, the alcohol she consumed impaired her ability to operate a vehicle safely. And can you tell us why why you came to that conclusion or what factors <clears throat> led you to that conclusion? Well, based on my observations, the, the fact that she went off the roadway, uh, uh, the fact that uh, her emotional state, uh, the, you know, again, I didn't, didn't have any tests, but uh, the uneasy on her feet, everything, the totality of everything, I definitely felt she was impaired. Deputy, you gave uh, a couple other citations in addition to OWI in this case. Um, first off, I think one was for uh, improving speed or driving too fast for conditions. Can you explain what um, your observations, what was the basis for that charge? If I recall, it was failure to maintain control, which would, uh, which is the was the perfect citation for this scenario the roads are not great and she was obviously driving way too fast for the conditions as uh, I could tell by how far off the road she was and then with respect to the citation for uh, uh, registration what was that based on uh, the registration on the vehicle was actually expired at the time of the incident it, were you able to um, with respect to the VIN number uh, on this vehicle, uh, were you able to, was that the same VIN number that you would have entered on the citations in this manner? Yes. Your Honor, I would offer the exhibits into evidence, subject to cross. Um, Mr. Anderson, any objections? No objections. Okay. Exhibits A, B, and C are admitted. Uh, 
Um, and deputy, just so I'm clear, the vehicle in question was that a the 2008 it was like a Ford SUV. That sounds correct. And again, would the registration or the VIN number that's on the citation that you issued be the one on the vehicle that was off the road that you found the defendant occupying? Yes. All right, I have no further questions for you. Okay. Uh, Attorney Anderson Cross. Thank you, Your Honor. Deputy Schaefer, Dean Kidd, you've been working in your capacity for 15 years? Correct. And specifically, you say that you've done a lot of, interacted with a lot of drunk drivers. I have. Okay. Now, has everyone you've suspected of being intoxicated, have they come, have they actually strike that? Everyone that you've perceived to be intoxicated, has their test result always come back above a point, a certain level? Not always. I've been wrong before. Okay. Now, on this night, you indicated that the road conditions were not great. Right? No, they weren't. And that's, that's an understatement, right? Yes. It was, it was snowing pretty heavily at the time. Correct. Right? And the roads were snow and ice covered. Yes, they were. Okay. Now, you indicated that in testimony that you believe the car was 30 to 50 yards off the road. Correct. Right? Um, now, and, and you, I'm going to back up. You are trained to write reports, correct? I am. That document your observations at the time. Correct. And you wrote a report in this case. I did. Correct. And you wrote it soon after the incident? Probably that night. Probably that night. So your recollection at that time was probably more accurate than it is now. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I, that's why I use my report usually to help you know, remember things that sure. I might not remember otherwise. Yeah. Now, if I told you that your report indicates that you observed the SUV was approximately 20 yards off the road, does that sound familiar? Yeah, I thought I put 30 to 50. Would you like to refresh your memory? Sure. Yeah. You don't mind? I can approach. Oh, you, you may approach. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then just to uh, refresh, be on the arrival on the scene. Take a look and read that and let me know. Okay. And this is your report, correct? It, it looks like it, yes. It would be fair to say that soon after you indicated it was about 20 yards off the road? Yeah, I mean, that. I mean, I've, I didn't use a tape measure. The conditions were horrible, but, yeah, it was well off the road. A absolutely. And, and I, I don't mean to nitpick at it, but there's, in my mind, 20 yards and 50 yards is kind of a significant difference. I would agree yeah. with that. And you also indicated that the depth of the snow is about one to one and a half feet off. Not on the road, but off the side of the road, correct? Yeah, because the plows come by and push all that snow off, and then it piles up. Have you ever had any previous interactions with Ms. Holland? No, I have not. Okay. So you observed that she had slurred speech at the time? Correct. And you're just basing that on what you perceived her tone and cadence to be, right? Correct. So you don't know if that's really how she always talks or if that had anything to do with intoxication? I don't know how she normally talks, but I'm guessing it wasn't like she was that night. Okay. But she was pretty emotional also. Yes. Okay. And she didn't have any issues answering your questions when you were talking to her, right? No. Yeah. And she answered in a coherent way? Most of the time, yes. Okay. Um, and part of that conversation, you testified that you asked her to do field sobriety tests, right? Correct. Um, but it was really more like, are you willing to do field sobriety, or will you do field sobriety tests, right? Yes, I just asked her if she'd be willing to do them, yes. Okay. And she gave you an answer like, uh, that she doesn't really want to, that they're scary? Yes. Okay, and you just kind of left it at that, right? Yes. Okay, so you didn't ask her like a second time? No, I didn't keep like... Or ask her if she's refusing to do the test or anything? No. Okay. So essentially at that time after you 
assisted with the passenger, you took her back to the Stoughton Police Department? I did. Okay. And she admitted that she had taken a couple shots of fireball in between that time, right? Correct. But she never indicated, like, when that happened? No. Okay. Now, she was continuing to be very emotional, right? Yes. Hyperventilating? Yes. And she indicated to you that she needed to use her inhaler? She may have. I don't recall that specifically. Okay. Um, and essentially, she wasn't able to provide a sufficient sample of her breath? No, she was not. Okay. And so I'm going to jump ahead to when you get to the Stoughton Hospital. You indicated that you asked her if she'd be willing to do a blood test, right? Yes. And you said that she agreed. She did. Do you recall how you asked her that question? I think I just asked, uh, you know, you weren't able to do the breath, would you be willing to do a blood test? And she said she would. Okay. But essentially, the thought of doing a blood test created more emotions, right? A lot more. Right, where she was physically shaking. She was. And shaking so much that you had to have two additional officers come to the scene. Yes. And it was quite an ordeal, right? Definitely. Yeah. And enough like where, in correct me if I'm wrong, but these officers had to hold her down in order for this blood draw to happen, right? Yeah, because if someone's physically shaking, you know, we don't want someone to get poked with a needle, you know. With a non-sworn person, we obviously don't want anybody to get hurt with a needle out, so. Okay. Now, how many times have you witnessed a blood draw? couple hundred. Okay. And how about how many of those were consensual blood draws? Some consensual, some not. Just depends. Okay. So it's fair to say that this was, for someone who supposedly consented, that this was some extreme behavior? Yes, I would say. She made it very clear she's not a big fan of needles. Right. In fact, she said that she didn't want her blood taken. She didn't say she didn't want her blood taken. She said she did not like needles, is what she told me. Okay. So you're saying that at no time during this I'll, I'll back up how long do you think it took to get her blood taken more than 20 minutes more than 20 minutes we say like a half hour well the collection time was at 11 47 p.m. Yeah. Uh, and the refusal was at 11 19 so we probably got to the hospital just doing the math at 25 after 11 and then the blood test was at 11.47, so 20-some minutes. Okay, 20-some minutes. But, I mean, that's a significantly long time to get a blood. It is. A consensual blood draw. It is, and depending on how, if hospitals are busy or not, I mean, I've waited a lot longer for blood, just, you know, with other scenarios. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you, you indicated that it took 20 minutes of trying to calm her down, and that's with two deputies <sighs> assisting by holding her down so needles aren't getting poked and... Yeah, I, I didn't. <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't. I didn't call the uh, Stoughton officers right away, uh, but as she was still physically shaking, I called just basically just to try to calm her down. Okay. And your testimony is that at no time did Emma say that she did not want to be a part of, of having her blood drawn. No, if she didn't want her blood drawn, I would have transported her to the jail and just I would have counted it as a refusal. Okay. Are you familiar with the Utica bar? I've been there a couple times. Okay. For work. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that, Deputy Schaefer. Um, do you know about how far the bar is from the scene of the, the accident, for lack of a better term? Well, it's it's right at uh, B and W, so it's probably uh, approximately two miles to N. And then it was just a very short distance south of there where she crashed, so okay. not very far. And just to be clear, you never personally witnessed uh, Miss Holland driving the vehicle? No, I did not. Okay. And you never, so you don't have any idea how fast she was going at the time, correct? 
No, I can only go by what I see at the scene. Okay. And were there like long skid marks or anything of that nature? Not really skid marks because you wouldn't be able to see them, but just, you know, going into the snow, you can just obviously follow the path of the tires and okay. that's kind of what I did to get down to the car. You say down the car, is it down a little bit of a culvert or something? Or can you explain that a little bit? Just off of, if I'm, if you ever drive on in, uh, the ditches are kind of like this. So as she went in, she just kind of kept going at an angle. And I mean, it's, it was not a huge, not a huge thing down there, but it's, it's a little bit, you know, it slants down a little bit. Let me clarify that for the record. We are being videotaped, but just in case, he, um, Officer or Deputy Schaefer did motion with his hands down. It looks like about six inches. Is that a fair statement? Thank you. So, any, any rejections from anybody? Is that fair? No, that seems accurate. Okay. And, and just to clarify, you weren't, you saw those tracks off of the road, correct? Yeah, I saw those tracks leading from the road and then into the the ditch where it would be grass and trees and brush and all that stuff, yes. Okay. So you did physically or observe tracks on the actual roadway? Yeah, you could see where she went into the ditch area. Okay. You could tell it was very fresh. Yeah. Do you have trouble walking up and down that road <coughs> at night? That evening? Yes. Yes, it was pretty deep. Okay. I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Evans, anything on redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, you may be excused. Thank you. Unless anybody wants to call him for rebuttal. I actually want to probably stick around for a little bit but when I said excuse but this concludes your um, testimony at this point does the town have any additional witnesses yes your honor we'll call by telephone the uh, the blood analyst it's Kimberly Glowacki and for the well, well I assuming she can testify her name but it's Glowacki is uh, G-L-O-W-A-C-K-I okay great thank you Stoughton Court. I'm going to transfer you to our um, microphone, so if you don't mind holding for a minute. Not at all. Thank you. Ms. Kowaki? Hello. Yes, this is she. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Judge Matt Rothy. Are you in a position where you can stand up at this point? I am standing. Okay. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Do you solemnly swear that the tr testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Sworn in, why don't you state your name for the record? And just so I can clarify, you're actually on an overhead microphone so the whole room can hear you. So if you have any difficulties in hearing any question or us, please let us know. Very good. I will. Okay. And please state and spell your name. Kimberly Glowacki. K-I-M-B-E-R-L-E-G-L-O-W-A-C-K-I. -E I'm going to now have you questioned by the town's attorney, Mr. Evans. Hi, Ms. Golwaki. Uh, hello? You, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Uh, where are you employed at? Uh, in the Forensic Toxicology Section at the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. And how long have you been employed there? I've been with the hygiene lab. It'll be 25 years tomorrow. Uh, I've been in the forensic toxicology section for about 10 years. The rest of the time I was in other areas of the laboratory, but I've always worked as a chemist. And what's your current position then at the Wisconsin State uh, Lab of Hygiene? I am an advanced chemist. And really briefly describe your education and training for that position. I have a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. 
uh, specific to my position in the forensic toxicology section. I successfully completed my analytical training, uh, applied for and was given a permit to perform um, the testing. Uh, additionally, I have attended the Borkenstein Alcohol and Drug Corps. I have audited standardized field sobriety testing that was um, given to new recruits. Uh, I have also participated um, in some dosing studies, and by that I mean preparing the doses and observing individuals as they're drinking. This is part of uh, a toxicalizer or breathalyzer training. And then I've also audited the um, drug recognition expert training school and field certification. Thank you. And do you possess a valid alcohol uh, analysis permit issued by the state? Yes. Uh, and did you possess a valid permit um, back, uh, for purposes of this case, back it looks like on uh, February 22nd, 2019? Yes. And um, does the lab possess a valid permit? Yes. Now, have you received any specific training to perform alcohol analysis? Yes. The um, initial statement I made about successfully completing that training. So um, part of that training was analyzing over 100 specimens which were previously analyzed by a permitted chemist. And once that was done, then I applied for that um, permit and then was granted that permit. Uh, have you ever tested blood samples for the presence of alcohol? Yes. And do you know approximately how many times? Uh, roughly 16,000 times. Have you been accepted before in Wisconsin courts as an expert in the analysis of blood samples for alcohol content? Yes. And do you know approximately how many times? 165. Um, I want to direct your attention to, you know, the blood sample relevant in our case today. Um, did you um, did you analyze a blood sample for a um, uh, Emma Holland, and it's a specific specimen number nineteen FX zero zero two four seven three. Yes, I did. And. How, can you explain to the court um, um, how does how did the blood specimen arrive at the state lab of hygiene? It was delivered by a Dane County Sheriff's deputy, in this case, uh, Deputy Scott Lehman. Okay, and how's the specimen received then by the lab? Uh, well, we 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 received them. In this case, this was received. It was delivered in person. We um, opened the boxes or the specimen containers in the order in which they are received. So when um, the time comes to open it, the box is opened, the information on the tube is compared to the information that is provided on the blood kit or submission form. Um, we note whoever opened the box to examine the contents, the date, the time that that was done, indicate the number of specimens, were they labeled, were they sealed, was there anything unusual about them, and then they are assigned a unique uh, analysis number, and then that unique ana analysis number is also assigned to each specimen. All right, and in this case, uh, did you also examine the specimen labels and seals for performing any analysis in the case? I did. And what do you do, you know, as, as performance of that? Do you initial... Uh, so we have, yes. Yeah. So we have a specimen receiving technician who opens the box, examine, you know, does that a process I just described. Then as the ethanol analyst in this case, I will verify that information. So I'm looking at all that same information 
I'm ensuring that the analysis number on the submission form matches the analysis number and is the same as that on the specimen container. Um, I'm checking that uh, the name, that the names are matching. If there's any discrepant information, I'm noting that. And then I provide my signature and date as verification that I've done these steps. Is it fair to say then that you analyze the blood specimen identified as being drawn from Emma Holland? Yes. And when would you have performed that analysis? February 20th of 2019. And can you br briefly describe uh, the method used to analyze the specimen for alcohol concentration? Yes. The method is ethanol and common volatiles by headspace gas chromatography. And what is done there is a portion of the sample is taken, it's placed into a tube, glass tube, roughly the size of a roll of quarters. That tube is capped, and the cap is crimped on. The vial is not completely full of the diluted specimen, roughly a quarter. The vial or a container is placed onto the instrument. The headspace or vapor above the liquid is what is sampled, and that is introduced into the instrument. And using the calibrators and controls that are run along with specimens, we are able to identify uh, ethanol in the sample and quantitative. it. And what procedures are used to verify the accuracy of your analysis? Um, it is a validated method. Each day before I begin my analysis, the instrument is calibrated. That calibration must meet acceptance criteria before proceeding. I run control material at the beginning, the end, and after every nine specimens in duplicate. The control material must be within acceptance criteria. Further, each specimen is analyzed in duplicate, and those two duplicates must agree within acceptance criteria. Um, before we can um, have a valid result to report. And were you able to successfully analyze the blood samples of Ms. Holland? Yes. And what was the result of the analysis? I'm going to object the, here. Uh, no. on, hang on, hang on Ms. Uh, um, yeah, w the objection? On foundation, Your Honor. If, if the, the city is trying to get this it's in. It's the town. town. I'm sorry, yeah. the town of Pleasant Spring. Yes. Uh, if the town is uh, trying to get this in through the implied consent statute, uh, there is some foundational issues. Uh, specifically, there is no time of operation in this case. And so to have this come in and have the admissibility, it must be shown that it was taken within three hours, and we don't have that. Okay. I'll take it under advisement to the objection. I won't rule it out at this point. I'll, I'll make that determination uh, at a later date. All right. Miss, um, let's see, is this a brown? Uh, you may answer the question. All right. The ethanol result of Ms. Holland's blood was 0 0.150 grams per 100 milliliter. And did you sign an official report of your analysis? Yes. And again, is that report, um, of course, you're on the telephone here, but we've marked an exhibit here as Exhibit D. Um, is that report? Um, a standard lab report that would have been produced by the State Lab of Hygiene? Yes, so I, in front of me I'm looking at uh, the laboratory report. There is the State Laboratory of Wisconsin, or State, Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. There is the University seal um, submitted by Dane County Sheriff's Department, uh, has their, the agency address, has Emma Holland's address is 1064 Tower Drive, Stoughton, and the specimen details of 19FX 002473, um, and then the, the result, um, and my signature, and the reviewer's signature. So that result, so that's what I'm looking at, if that is also what you're looking at. 
zero, the ethanol result of Ms. Holland's blood was 0 0.150 grams per 100 milliliters. All right, thank you. And uh, under lab comments, then of course you you sign you sign uh, with your typed name under, correct? Yes. And then it's then certified to it uh, looks like by Thomas Newhouser, an advanced chemist. Yes, he was the reviewer of my data in this case. All right, thank you, uh, Your Honor. We'd offer Exhibit D into evidence. Uh, is that um, contingent on your prior objection? Correct, yeah. uh, so no, as well as the motion. Okay, I'll 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 admit it now, but I'll I'll review the weight and admissibility um, um, when I make my decision then. Okay. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. Um, well, I do have one more. In your opinion, based on your training and experience, um, is the result of the 0 0.150 grams per 100 milliliters uh, accurate? Yes. All right, thank you. I have never, no further questions for you. Okay, Attorney Anderson, cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a few questions, Mrs. Glowacki. I, I apologize if I did not pronounce that right. But you... You have it correct. Thank you. You talked about an acceptance criteria. Can you explain what that is? Right. So for all of the control material, for the, the agreement of the duplicate, so um, for the control material... We know those, the, what that result is to be, and um, the variance or variability in that is um, 0 0.005 or 5%, whichever is greater. And the same thing for um, the test result, the agreement of the duplicates in order to report that result. So you can correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially if you have a test on one of your controls, which let's say you know it's a it's a it's a point one. If you run the test and it comes back within five percent or point zero zero five of that, that's an acceptable test, correct? You, and you're talking about the control material. Or are you talking about specimen? The control material. Yes. So yes. So if it was 0 0.095, that would be acceptable on a control material. With, with, for, with for the control what, of point 0.1. Hang on. Uh, one person at a time, please. Sorry. Ms. Kowalki, wait. Uh, if you could, I know you can't see us. Wait till he's done with the question, and that, that will make it easier for the record. And I'll rephrase my... Here. Sorry. I'll rephrase my question. If you have a control specimen of that's supposed to be or it's been previously tested at point one and you run your test and it comes back at a point zero nine five that's acceptable it would be okay now is there a different uh acceptability for specimens no the agreement between the two specimens to be considered valid and to report that they must be within 0 0.005 or 5% of the lower value. Okay. And you reported that, that Ms. Holland's test came back at a 0 0.150, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so it's fair to say that your opinion is that her ethanol concentration at the time her blood was drawn was a 0.15, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, can you give us any sort of opinion about what her test, what her level might have been an hour before or two hours before? I can provide an opinion. And what would you base it would have on? been different. Okay. I would need some information. Um, to make a better opinion. Yeah. But it, it's fair to say that it would be different at any given time, correct? Different than the blood draw collection time, yeah. Thank you. No further questions for you. Okay. Anything on redirect? Ma'am, you were asked uh, what information, or could you extrapolate what 
what alcohol level would have been of this subject um, an hour or two prior to the blood draw, correct? Yes. What information would you need? Um, I would need to know if there had, what the drinking had been, if there had been any consumption of alcohol in that um, half hour before the, the um, earlier time that we are considering or the different time that we are considering. Um, is this an earlier time period we are looking at? If that is the case, you know, what is what was the drinking that half hour before? Was there consumption over a period of time before that in terms of hours before that? Was there any consumption after that time period of interest? Yeah. If I if I told you, you know, the subject is a seventeen year old woman approximately 5'7", maybe 180 pounds, had not been drinking at least from 10, 18 p.m. to the point in time where the blood was drawn, which I don't know if you have that time, but let me... Uh, it would be on the submission form, so that's that blood kit form with the state of Wisconsin on the top. I have... Uh, I have a time of collection as 11.47 p.m. Okay, on Exhibit D it says 23.47, is that, or I'm sorry, on, on the, we get it, so 11.47. So if you can look at then, you know, an hour and a half period, it looks like between when we know the subject wasn't drinking, you know, let's say there's a stop or something, and when the blood is drawn, are you able to estimate or, or extrapolate what approximately the blood alcohol level would be that hour and a half prior to the blood draw? And I'm going to uh, ob object, Your Honor, um, one on kind of a Daubert ground. I don't know if, if she has testified as to her experience to make this determination, and two, um, it's really speculation at this point. She's been certified as an expert 165 times. I'll find that the, I'll overrule on the Daubert, um, on the uh, Daubert ruling. As far as the um, foundation, again, I'll take it under advisement. I'll, and I think before I said it goes to the weight instead of the, I think I said credibility. I should have said it goes to the weight instead of the admissibility of it. I'll, I'll take that into account. I, I actually, I'll allow her to answer the question, but I'll take it under advisement. Okay. You may answer the um, question, Ms. Yeah. Kowalki. Yes, I, I need to perform a calculation, so that's what I'm doing right now. So if I may have just a moment or a minute. Okay, take your time, please. Ms. Klawacki? Yes. Sorry, just one question on the, the weight. I don't know if you needed the weight, but can I change it to 155 pounds? I don't know if that made a difference to your calculations. Um, uh, it, it may only if they're, um, so a female, 5 foot 7 inches, 155 pounds, um, that would, would come into play if we need to consider any um, unabsorbed alcohol. So that would be if there was consumption very close to that earlier time point that we we're estimating the BAC at.
so an estimate of the blood alcohol concentration, if we uh, have a blood draw at 11.47 and that test result is 0 0.150, uh, we, uh, we um, add in the amount that was eliminated by the body in that hour and a half to that our earlier time point, roughly 10.15, uh, the estimated BAC would be 0.16 to 0.19 grams per 100 milliliter. I used a range of elimination rates. Uh, I used a 0.01 to 0.025 grams per 100 milliliter per hour. That is a range that is the rate at which a person burns off alcohol. Um, and I further assume no unabsorbed alcohol is um, what I mean by that is that there wasn't consumption um, very close to that earlier time point of approximately 10, 15 p.m. that we were uh, we were interested in here. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions for you. Okay, uh, uh, recross. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, now, you, your calculation just makes a, a fair amount of assumptions, correct? Yes, I believe I've stated those. Okay. And so there's a lot of factors that can alter that calculation. Uh, well, so we start with a, a chemical test result. That is a known evidentiary test result. We add back in, and I use that range. Uh, a person who is an infrequent drinker would eliminate at a slower rate, 0.01. A person who is a more frequent drinker would eliminate at that higher rate, and that is why we have that range. I assumed no unabsorbed alcohol. Okay. So that, that assumes no unabsorbed alcohol, and so there's – I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Any further questions? No further questions. Anything on uh, re redirect? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Ms. Kowalki, uh, thank you for your testimony. That concludes uh, your portion for the trial. You're welcome, Your Honor. Have a good evening. Thank you. Your Honor, um, I plan to call Ms. Holland next, but I did mark an exhibit. I think it's self authenticating, but this is for purposes of the registration. On registration citation and the pertinent part was on page two at the bottom it just shows when the vehicle ended up being registered which was February 23rd 2019 so we'll offer this exhibit uh, for the purpose of that citation mr. Anderson any objections No objections. Okay. Exhibit E is admitted. According to my records, A, B, C, D, and E have all been admitted. All right. Uh, and next, we'll call it Ms. Holland. Then. Okay, Ms. Holland, if you want to approach. Please raise your right hand. Repeat after me. You solemnly swear that the truth. Listen, then you don't have to repeat this, Judge. Or I've it before. You soundly swear that the testimony about the given this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, you guys, all right. Please be seated and state and spell your name, please. Emma Holland, E M M A H O L L A N D. Mr. Evans. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Holland, you're the defendant in this case, correct? Yep. I'm going to turn your attention back to. January 27th, 2019, um, you recall you're involved in this incident that we're in her testimony for already, correct? Yes, sir. Um, you were, is it fair to say you were driving a vehicle um, on County Highway N in the town of Pleasant Springs and did you slide off the road? Yes, sir. Uh, where were you coming from at the, when, when you slid off the road? We were leaving from Utica. The Utica bar? Yes, sir. At what time did you leave there? I don't recall. Uh, well, was it at night? Yes, sir. And uh, how long had you been at the Utica bar? That was a pretty short trip, about 20 minutes. You were at the bar for 20 minutes? Yes, sir. 
And did you go to the bar by yourself? No, sir. Who did you go to the bar with? My mom. And your mom is Nadine. She was the passenger then in the vehicle? Yes, sir. And what did you do at the Utica bar for 20 minutes? I just sat there as my mom was talking to her friends. Did you have any consume any alcohol beverages at the Utica bar? No, sir. What was your mom's condition with respect to alcohol? Was not able to drive. Did you go to pick her up at the bar? I was there with her. Was she already at the bar when you arrived at the bar? Me and her arrived at the same time. And where was your mom drinking prior to the bar? We made a few stops throughout the day. The first stop was at the bar M and J's in Broadhead. That was for my uncle's birthday. What time was that at? I do not recall. Do you know what time, uh, what time would you have, did you go to different bars then that day? Yes, sir. And approximately what time did you start going to bars with your mom? Could you clarify on yeah, that? Yeah, earlier in the day you had been, you said you, were, you had gone to different bars in addition to the Utica bar, correct? Yes, our first bar was M&J's. And did you go to another bar after that? Yes, sir. What was that? The Red Barn in Evansville. And did you go to another bar after that? Yes, sir. What was that? Uh, Union. And what did you go to another bar after that? And then it was Utica. At what time did you get to MJ's? I don't recall. Was it during the daytime? Yes, sir. Mid-evening. You got to MJ's at mid-evening? It okay. was later in the day. So by the time you left the Utica bar, um, how long had you guys been bar hopping? I don't recall, sir. Was it for more than an hour? Yes, sir. More than two hours? Yes, sir. More than three hours? A little more than three hours. All right. And during these bar trips, uh, your, was, did your mom consume alcohol beverages? Yes, sir. And did you consume alcohol beverages? Yep. And what alcohol beverages did you consume? At the Red Barn in Evansville, I had one Pabst Blue Ribbon, and that was it. And that was the Red Barn. What about the other bars? When we went to Union, I had two White Russians. And then, did you have anything else at Union? No, sir. Okay, and then, um, so we went, what about MJ's? Did you have anything there? No, sir. And then what other drinks then did you have? That was it. Okay. Do you remember telling the uh, deputy that you were completely sober and hadn't been drinking? Yes, sir. Was that true? That I told him that? Or that was it true if I was sober and not drinking? Was it true that you were sober and not drinking? It was not true that I was not drinking. Okay. You were buzzed? Yes. Were you buzzed at the time you are driving from the Utica? I... Didn't feel like I was, sir. Okay. Later, do you realize you were? No, sir. Do you remember telling the deputy that you had shots of fireball? Yes, sir. And where would you have had shots of fireball at? It would have been at my house, but that was not true. I did. Why did you? Why did you tell the deputy you had shots of fireball? When I went into the ditch, my emotions and just everything just went downhill. And I wasn't thinking, and the first thing that would ever come to my mind was all these lies that I told him. Um, how long were you in the ditch before the deputy appeared and knocked on your window? I'm not sure. Okay. More than 10 minutes? Yes, sir. More than 15? Yes, sir. About half an hour? I'd say about 18 minutes. And what were the road conditions like that night? Very poor. And why do you say that? Because it was snowing very hard. It was one of the first snowfalls that we had, like the heavier snowfalls. And road conditions were sloshy with the slush. And uh, what I was able to see, my, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for. It was snowing really heavily, so I couldn't see that far in front of me. And do you... How fast do you think you were driving right before you slid off the road? I'm 
I'm not sure, but I was going faster than I should have for me to slide off. Do you say that? Why do you say that? Because I remember going up to the stop sign and then turning. It was a little bit too fast, and I slid into the ditch. Is that prior to the falling into the ditch on Highway N, like a different one, or no? It was a ditch that I okay. went into. Did you, you remember being back at the police station and the officer was reading you the form? Yes, sir. Um, and asked you to do a breath test? Yes, sir. Right. You agreed that you would do a breath test? Yep. Is it fair to say that, that that didn't happen or for whatever reason you didn't provide sufficient samples, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And did the deputy ask you then to do a, a blood test? Yes. And did you say yes? No. Are you saying that the deputies not telling the truth tonight? You agreed, though, that you gave the deputy false information, though, in your interactions with them back on the night of your arrest, correct? Yes, sir. What time did you have your last drink? I'm not sure. Prior to the Utica bar? I don't recall how long we were at Union, but Union is about 30 minutes away from Utica. Did you guys have any drinks in the car? No, sir. Did you tell the deputy that your mom had called you from Utica to pick, you, pick her up? Yes, sir. And why'd you tell him that? I was freaking out and wasn't thinking. You think you were impaired the night when you were driving off? Well, wait. You, okay, just wait till he's finished with the question. Do you feel like you were impaired to drive at the time, even slightly, at the time that you were driving from the Utica bar home? I felt fine, sir. How many times have you driven that road before? Maybe Pro about 10 times. Are you familiar with that road? Yes, I used to do some work in the fields on that road. Prior to the arrest? Yeah. Now, there were drink tokens, is that fair to say, in your pocket from the Utica? Yes, sir. What were those? Just the free drink tokens. So who gave those to you? They were my mom's, and as we were leaving, I got them off the table and I put them into my pocket. All right, I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, uh, Cross. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Ms. Holland, you're 17 years old, correct? Yes, sir. Is it fair to say you're still in high school? Yes, sir. What else do you do outside of high school? I work a lot. And what, is, what, what do you do? I milk cows, and every now and then I'll be welding. Okay. You indicated that that night it was your, your uncle's Birthday. party? Yes, sir. Okay. And you, you went to a few different places with your mother, but you weren't drinking at all the places? Nope. And I, I believe you said you had your last drink at the Union? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you drink a lot? No. Okay. But you still felt, in your opinion, you were fine to drive? Yes, sir. And were you driving the whole time, or did your mom drive? My mom drove to M&J's. But when she had her first drink, I drove the rest of the way. Yeah. Now, you indicated that you thought maybe you were going faster than you should have. Yes. Is that just because of the results of going into the ditch? Yes. Do you have any estimate of how fast maybe you were going? I don't remember. Yeah. 
Um, and you testified that you agree that there was maybe some false information that you provided the officer. Yes. And that was because you were freaking out, I believe you put it? Yep. Um, have you ever been in a situation like this before? No, sir. Um, you also testified that the officer had asked you to provide a sample of your breath and you agreed to that, correct? Yes. Um, but then you said that when he asked you to provide a sample of your blood that you did not agree. And, and you, you heard the deputy testify earlier, right? And that he said that you did consent. Is that correct? Yes. Or correct that he said that? Yes, sir. Why do you think there's that disconnect? I don't know. Are you, are you a, is there a reason why you wouldn't consent to a blood draw? Yes. And what is that? I am absolutely horrified of needles. Okay. So can you ever imagine any time that you would agree to that? No, sir. Have you had shots in the past? Yes, sir. And I'll clarify, like, yeah. immunizations. Yes. Okay. And were you able to take those? I've passed out many of times okay. to where so, the nurse had to watch over me. Okay. So during this time, do you remember being at the hospital? Yes. Okay. And why do you remember it? Because it's one of those moments where you just don't forget. It's so traumatizing. And what made it so traumatizing? How the cops had to hold me down as I kept refusing to, as they were trying to take my blood, the nurse. Yeah. Was the nurse able to take your blood in a clean manner? After sticking me two times, she got the blood. And was that because you were moving around? Yes, sir. Were you at all saying that you, during that time, to, to stop? Yes, sir. Do you recall like exactly what you said? Uh, don't stick me with that needle. I fear of needles, and then I kept asking for my inhaler. Now, after the blood was taken, where, where were you taken to? I was taken back into the squad car to go to the jail. Okay. And how long were you at the jail? For less than 12 hours. Less than 12? Almost. I'm sure it felt like an eternity, though. Yeah. any further questions for you. Thank you. A redirect. Just so we're clear at the after the blood was drawn again you or while the blood was drawn you were, were you telling the deputy that you didn't have anything to drink? I later admitted that I was drinking. At the time that they um, okay At the time that the deputy was transporting you to the public safety building in the jail, um, did you tell the deputy that if you find a video of you anywhere, you're going to shove it up his fucking ass? Yes, sir. So you fair to say you were still buzzed? You could feel alcohol in your system at the time you were being transported to the jail? I was beyond upset, and I said things that I really should not have. Could you feel that you had been drinking at that time? I still felt fine. We, well, feeling fine, the question is, could you still tell? Could you, you can tell if you've had alcohol yeah. in your system, right? Even if you just have one or two drinks, right? Mm -hmm. At the time that you were being transported to the jail, could you still tell that you had been drinking earlier? With how my emotions were, it was way beyond that. I was crying, I was shaking. Could you still tell that you had been drinking? That feeling really didn't come across to me with all the other emotions. All right, 
No further questions. Anything on recross? No, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Holland. You may uh, step, step down. Thank you. Does the town have any further witnesses? Uh, no, Your Honor. The, uh, assuming we've marked or offered all of our exhibits, uh, the town will rest. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson, would you like to call any witnesses? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, the evidence portion, obviously no rebuttal witnesses. We close the evidentiary portion of the trial. Uh, closing arguments. Yes, Your Honor. Um, I think it's clear from, we haven't ruled on the admissibility but of, of the blood, but assuming the evidence that I think should come in has been offered, blood evidence aside, it's clear from the deputy's own testimony, experience, interactions with the defendant, the fact the defendant, he could clearly tell the defendant had been drinking, she had slurred speech, bloodshot eyes, there was an accident, obviously a lack of judgment given the weather conditions and the her driving where she would slide off the road. Um, her demeanor, her, her interactions with the officer of lying and admitting to drinking, but I, I'm not sure what to believe uh, for, from the defendant on how much she had to drink because I've had, we've had different stories now. But all of that combined is sufficient to find, in the officer's opinion and what the court should find, that the defendant is guilty of OWI first offense. It's clearly she showed signs of impairment and it's clear that she admits she was the one driving. Um, it's clear that her, her consumption of alcohol, whether it's two white Russians in a PBR or, and or shots of fireball, I'm not sure what to believe, but apparently with the bar hopping she admitted to, I think the totality of all those things shows that she is guilty of OWI, regardless of what we know there is some blood level, but uh, that there's alcohol in her system, consistent with you know what the officer observed uh, of finding impairment w with her. With respect to the um, other citations, I don't really think there's much of a dispute on those. The, the registration ticket, I think the DO, DMV record speaks for itself that the car wasn't registered at the time. And the, the driving violation, too, I think is self-evident from the road conditions and what happened. Going back now to the blood evidence, um, and particularly the motion, you know, to suppress that, again, I, whether you, however you rule on that, I, I, there's sufficient evidence to convict the defendant anyway uh, on OWI. But with respect to uh, should you receive that evidence, um, it's not a question of testing not being done correctly, I think we can all agree that the expert who testified was very competent uh, and be able to give an opinion and accuracy as to the blood results. Uh, the, the question is, well, was there consent, you know, it was, you know, can that um, blood evidence come in based on either, I'm not sure on the motion if the defendant is saying there's an implied consent violation or consent was somehow withdrawn and so you needed a warrant but you know I can address both uh, items uh, under the implied consent law there's no requirement that under the statutes or any case that an implied consent form or the, the um, verbatim uh, the verbatim form which is verbatim from the statute be read multiple times to a defendant certainly there's no harm in that I think generally but there's no requirement it be read multiple times. And in fact, the statute under 343.305 and the actual form speak of, uh, when you read them, of that law enforcement can ask for a combination of tests, multiple tests, breath, blood, urine, a combination of those. And the actual check question of do you submit a chemical, evident, a chemical test of your blank, fill in the blank, that's not in the statute. That's not under the implied consent law. That's certainly appropriate, though, for the officer to ask those questions and make a record of it. But there's no requirement that, you know, that that form be read twice, three times, if you know, we do a breath test and we also want to do a blood test. Or for whatever reason we, we needed to do the blood test, like in this case, which probably could have been treated as a refusal. But the officer, in good faith, gave that opportunity for the defendant to provide another, a different sample. 
Um, so there's no requirement under the law that informing the accused form be read twice. And it comes down to, well, did she consent? I think this comes down to a credibility issue of the witnesses where we have a, a, the deputy who's been uh, doing this for many years, and his veracity, versus the defendant who a, agrees that she lied to the deputy. And, and the problem is when we're looking at someone's veracity and credibility, uh, you know, it, it becomes less believable, I think, from the defendant's side when they've lied about other things in the case pertinent to their drunk driving case. And now they expect you to just dismiss what the deputy has to say uh, with respect did she voluntarily give that consent. It's clear that if she didn't give consent, the easy answer for the deputy could have been either one, treating it as a refusal, or two, obtaining a warrant. There's no need to that under the Fourth Amendment grounds. Once you give consent, as she did here, is that the deputy is more credible. There's no requirement that you know, a warrant be obtained. So then the question comes down to, well, did she withdraw that consent at any time? Well, I think it's clear from the chain of events that we've had here that this was very emotional a very emotional issue for the defendant, given her age, what happened. And I think the deputy's description of that was very credible. He agrees that she was shaking at times, even during, you know, during this intoxicator, during his interactions with her. So her behavior at the hospital seems consistent with as she was interacting with him previously. The fact that people had to be helped her to calm down, to be able to successfully draw the blood, doesn't mean that she verbally did some act to withdraw consent. You know, we're not, uh, deputies, law enforcement are, are, not, are, are not supposed to guess at what the defendant might be thinking. You know, once they've verbally consented to do the blood draw, we can't speculate, well, maybe they've withdrawn. You know, but what we do know is she was impaired, she had been drinking, and obviously very nervous, and her actions at the hospital are consistent with how she was acting previously. So when we look at the issue of credibility, uh, obviously the deputy, I think the court should put more weight on his testimony as to what happened. Based on her consent to the blood test, given, and again, that consent was given in close proximity to when that informing the accused form was read. And we're not talking a great length of time here. We're talking the limited time between when that was read and her failure to give the proper breath sample. It was freshly read to her. It's appropriate for the officer or the deputy to ask that question again, will you submit to a blood test? And she, and she affirmed that she would. Um, based on all those things, the court should deny the defendant's motion to suppress. Now, if it was just a question of was the informing the accused form improperly given, you know, the remedy anyway for an informing the accused violation isn't su suppression of the evidence. What, what happens is, and I think the Zielke case discussed that, a uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court case, uh, but it just the remedy is you lose some of the presumptions with that happens under implied consent law, you know, uh, if there's a refusal, for example, or administrative suspensions. And so the, the, the remedy, even if there was an implied consent violation, which seems to be what they're alluding to in their motion, isn't suppression of the evidence. And in this case, we've provided proper foundation of the blood draw, a testimony from an expert from the state lab of hygiene. And so there's no there's no real basis here to, uh, there was consent, so even if that consent wasn't su sufficient for implied consent, well, there was consent, so even if there was an implied consent violation, that doesn't, the remedy is not suppression of the evidence. So for all those reasons, you should deny, deny the defendant's motion. You should receive the testimony of the expert who testified to 0 0.15 grams per 100 milliliter uh, reading along with her expert report. So uh, based on that, all of that, we'd ask that you find the defendant guilty of all three charges. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. Your Honor, I, I don't disagree on the fact of, of how many times an informing the accused form needs to be read. Um, I, I don't, our position isn't that he the deputy should have necessarily read the informing the accused form a second time. However, I do disagree with the once you give consent, that's it. Uh, I think under the Fourth Amendment, uh, an individual always has a right to withdraw consent. And I think when you're talking about a breath test 
compared to a blood test, there's a significant difference. And I, the Supreme Court has recognized that difference. Um, and it said in, in United States, or in, in Birchfield, that Birchfield versus North Dakota, Your Honor, that, right, that a test requires a piercing of a skin and extraction of the subject's body. That is a huge difference than providing a breath sample. And they have indicated such that criminal penalties are not uh, appropriate for refusal, refusal of a blood test, um, but it might be for refusal of a breath test. And my point, that isn't really the issue here, Your Honor, but my point is, is that in real life situations, you can't take the consent for consent to provide a breath test and transfer that to the consent to provide a blood test. Now, we look at what the deputy testified to at the hospital. We've got a, a young girl who is physically shaking, where it takes two additional deputies to come in to physically restrain her to remove this blood. Now, whether or not you believe uh, Ms. Holland when she indicated that she did not consent to that, I think her actions are, are very clear that she did not want her blood taken. Um, and I, I believe that that is evident uh, in the testimony here today. And so without consent, without a warrant, without extingent circumstances to which we have heard uh, no basis for, uh, that blood draw violated the Fourth Amendment. And so we ask you to find to grant our motion to to suppress the results of that test. What we also heard today from the deputy is that the road conditions were, were horrible. They were very bad. And we heard that from the deputy and we heard that from Ms. Holland, that it was actively snowing, that the roads were snow covered, that there was ice, there was slush. And that is likely a huge factor into Ms. Holland's vehicle going off the road. Outside of that, we have the observations of a smell of intoxicants, and we have the observations of what the deputy interpreted as slurred speech. Um, but we don't really have any other indication that her ability to operate the motor vehicle was impaired. Uh, certainly, there can be some argument that a car in the ditch can show impairment, but we also have to consider the significant road conditions at the time. No one saw her driving. No one said she was driving erratically. No one said she was, we don't know how fast she was going. Ms. Holland did indicate that she believed she was probably going too fast and that's what led her into the ditch. But we don't have any observations of um, stumbling, of not being able, not being coordinated, not being able to do things that would be required to operate that motor vehicle. Um, and Your Honor, that's, that's the only evidence we have here today about the operating while intoxicated charge. And, and we ask you to find her uh, not guilty. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Evans, anything on a rebuttal? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, thank you for both your arguments. Both attorneys did a good job, an excellent job actually presenting this evidence. I need to do some research on the, this blood draw, and then the, there's a potential 90-day issue as well. Um, so I'm going to take this under advisement. I'll issue a written opinion, um, and I'll get it to both forthwith. At this point, a lot of attorneys will ask me, do I need to brief an issue? No, I, I, I have the, the knowledge in front of me. I'll just need to do, um, there's a few questions I have to answer, and I'll issue a written opinion in this matter, and I hope to do so within the 21 days. Your Honor, if I could recommend, I didn't mention it in redirect, but I think there's a case that's somewhat relevant to um, what consent versus implied consent and consent under Fourth Amendment purposes in State v. Brar was a recent case from the Wisconsin Supreme Court of 2017. I thought that was... Uh, how do you say that, State Brar, versus? it's B-R-A-R, but I can give you the site. It's th 376 Wiz 2nd 685. But I, I think that had some... I'll take a look at that. Yeah. So. Okay. So I will issue my written opinion within 21 days. If it's going to be later than that, I'll let everybody know. But um, just that I need to do my own research and my own homework, and I'll, I'll issue a decision. Thank you to both of you. That case is adjourned.
Here's the Christmas print. Yeah. yeah. Before you can get it. Here's the Christmas print. Actually, while well, I've got you. Mr. Evans? Yes, sir. So, I have, I have, um, for speeding cases, I tend to give a 10 mile an hour leeway. I presume that you don't have any objection to that, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it just tend because that, normally that's just a way of kind of expediting a lot of these yeah. speeding cases. Yeah. And, okay, good. I, I didn't have I hadn't had a chance to tell. You. I, I I think I did it on a couple of them, but I should yeah. went to the chair. I should ask them. Sometimes the drivers are so bad that you can't do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Have fun at the Badger's game. Oh, absolutely. How'd you know that? Your wife is my sister-in-law's boss. Oh, okay. <laughs> Small world. I was coming here and she said. I think I know the judge. You're not talking to me. <laughs> really? I know everything. I'm a cop. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, actually, do we have time? I had parent teacher conferences, but I'm going to miss them. So, do that. So, they have involved with it. Do you know what time they are tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. I'll sneak on yeah, I think I'll probably go tomorrow then. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's go talk in my. Uh, Brandon, this Adams had a pretrial. Do you know did she go to her pretrial? I suppose.